coming attraction. There's death. To die. To expire. To pass on. To perish. To peg out. To push up daisies. To push up posies. To become extinct. Curtains. Deceased. Demised. Departed and defunct. Dead as a doornail. Dead as a herring. Dead as a mutton. Dead as nits. The last breath. Paying a debt to nature. The big sleep. God's way of saying, slow down. To check out. To shuffle off this mortal coil. To head for the happy hunting ground. To blink for an exceptionally long period of time. To find oneself without breath. To be the incredible decaying man. Worm buffet. Kick the bucket. By the farm. Take the cab. Cash in your chips. And if we bury us up, we have a place to park my bike. <laughs> Well, good morning and welcome. Glad you are here. If you need a set of notes, go ahead and raise your hand, please, and we'll get you one. Not that long ago, I had the, the privilege to officiate at a funeral service for one of our great uh, saints in the Lord, a lady that I've known for a long time. And I was informed just several weeks ago that she received some mail from a book club that she was a part of. Even though the book club was contacted and told of her demise, they sent a letter, and in the letter they said, hurry back, we miss you. <laughs> I'm not sure that's going to happen. As you can see from the video clip, we're going to be talking about death and dying, what happens when you die. And as we get into the first uh, Corinthians, as we in first Corinthians again, and the, the church at Corinth, once again, they had another problem. And the problem was that falsehood had infiltrated the church from the culture around them. That's usually how it happens. And rather than truth infiltrating the church, a false belief or a false view on what happens when you die was seeping in. And so Paul, the apostle, is going to deal with the questions that are being thrown his way. And we're going to see these questions, two questions, in the middle of the chapter, of chapter 15, verse 35. Here's what the questions are. But someone may ask, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body will they come? Now, you may not have these questions per se, but I can guarantee this, others around you have these questions. They're asking questions about what happens when you die. Uh, they have their own views, and you need to have an answer to what you believe and why you believe it. And so it's good for us to, to understand what Paul is going to lay out for us about the Christian or the biblical belief of a resurrected body. And he starts off by dealing with these questions. Now, these questions were sort of skeptical questions. They were mocking questions in a sense because they were going, oh, yeah, Paul? Oh, what about this then, Paul? What about if your body is mangled, it's burned or destroyed? So, Paul, what's it say? Uh, what kind of body are they going to have? How are the dead raised? How are the dead raised if their body was destroyed? What if your body was destroyed in an explosion? I was recently reading about Joseph Kennedy Jr. He's the older brother to John F. Kennedy. They both served in World War II. And there's a lot of questions and debate about why he did what he did because Joseph Kennedy Jr. is sort of the heir apparent, even had plans for him for the presidency and everything else. Uh, but this is after John F. Kennedy became sort of a, a famous war hero with a PT-109 story. But he, uh, Joseph uh, Jr. had done his quota of missions. And he had act was actually free to go home. But he volunteered for a dangerous mission. On July 23, 1944, he volunteered to co-pilot a plane that was really a bomb. It was a remote-controlled plane, but back in those days, they couldn't take off uh, with a plane like that. So two pilots had to take off, and then they would parachute out. Something went terribly, horribly wrong. The bombs inside the plane all went off. And they were, both pilots were instantly vaporized. And so the Corinthians were in a sense saying, when something happens like that, how can a resurrection of a body take place? How can you have a resurrected body? God, there's nothing else to put back together again. 
And so how can God even take all of the people who have lived for all of history, who have passed on, and somehow put all the pieces back together again? You know, all the king's men, all the king's horses is going to do that. Paul, the resurrection is a farce. And that's why some people just say, look, hey, when you die, that's it. Ashes to ashes, dust to dust. There's nothing to come. There's nothing to look forward to. And then they asked another question, what kind of body are they going to have, Paul? Explain, if you die as a baby, do you come back as a baby? You ever thought about that? If you die as an adult, uh, an older person, do you come back old, crippled, liver spots? <laughs> uh, we don't want that. How do you come back, Paul? And, uh, or do we come back maybe as a, an animal? A lot of people believe that. Sort of reincarnation. We come back as a, an animal, a bird, a, a bug, a, a little Debbie's cupcake. What do we come back? How do we come back? Well, I, was, uh, I recently saw a documentary, and it was on a temple in, in India. And it was a temple dedicated to rats. I don't know if anyone saw this. And the rats ran free. They fed their rats. They petted their rats. They just took care of their rats. It was a temple dedicated to rats because they were sacred, because the rats contained the souls of departed human beings. Was that true? Does reincarnation happen? The Bible says it's appointed for man to die once, and then comes judgment. Or maybe we don't come back in a body of somebody or something else, Oh, what if we are just absorbed, like many people believe now, into the great cosmic universe? We are one with all living things. I used to call it the, the Lion King theology, if you ever watched that. How about now that it's called the Avatar theology? Remember the tree of souls, the closest connection you could have with Iwa, uh, a connection with all plants and with all living things. And a lot of people believe things like that. So what's true? What happens when we die? And that's what Paul is dealing with. But before we even get there, Paul is going to say how we answer those questions. What we believe is going to determine a whole lot in our whole life. If we're going to be effective, if we're going to stay in the game, or if we're going to be on the sidelines looking in. This is what Paul says in verse 58. At the very end of the chapter, he says, guys, here's the reason you need to know what you believe. Verse 58. Therefore, my dear brothers, stand what? Stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor is not in vain. See, stand firm, he is saying. Be steadfast, immovable. Don't be swayed. Don't be carried away. Hang in there, he is saying. Be strong on this one issue. You better be strong in this issue. You better stand strong against false teaching, against the culture around you. And that's why we need to hear this today. We have a culture around us that believes a lot of different things. Uh, do, we, do we just come back as another form and another body to get a better try to live life over again? Uh, are we just absorbed into the cosmic universe? We better get a handle on this because it will determine how we live. If, our, if we're going to be in the labor, uh, God's labor for his church. It's interesting that over the years I've, I've come across people that I would say they're strong, godly believers. And then a death happens to a close friend or a family member. And something happens. And all of a sudden they become very distant towards God, God's people, God's word. And, and questions come in. Anger comes in, disappointment comes in, frustration comes in, and it comes in with a vengeance. And see, death will do that to you. We better have a handle on what the truth really is. We better know the truth so we can be strong in the truth. And Paul is going to go through this last section of 1 Corinthians, and he's going to just weave in and out and lay out the view of what he believes in the resurrection of a body. Here's the first reason we should be strong. Number one, be strong in light of a new body. Be strong in light of a new body. Paul is going to tell us that God is going to give us a brand new body. Uh, look at verses 36 to 37. He starts off, he says, How foolish! What you sow does not come to life unless it dies. When you sow, you do not plant the body that will be, but just a seed, perhaps of wheat or, or something else. So Paul starts off, he starts saying, hey guys, this is, this is foolish. You don't understand something. God does not take the old body 
and try to reconstruct it and try to put all the pieces back together again. You don't understand something. God is going to give us a new body. Now, I remember years ago now, I was at another church. It was late on a Saturday night after the Saturday night service. This family walked in, and they didn't even come to the service, but they walked in. They came up to me, and they said, are you a pastor? And I said, yes. And they said, well, we want you to pray for Grandpa for us. There was like five or six of them. And they said, well, I'll, I'll pray for Grandpa. Where is Grandpa? Assuming he was in the hospital or something like that. And they reached down, and they had a bag, and they pulled out of the bag a bottle. And they said, well, Grandpa's right here. <laughs> And uh, I didn't really know what to say, and so I wanted to be careful because I wanted to speak truth and yet be very sensitive. And I said, well, excuse me a second. I'm going to go to my office and just grab my Bible because I did want my Bible. But I wanted time to think, too. And I came back, and I said, you know, I, I, I can tell you're really hurting, and I want to pray for you. I can't really pray for grandfather, be your grandfather, because he has already passed on. And, but I will pray for you. And right when I said that, their heads just dropped. I thought, oh no, now, now I really hurt them and offended them. And I, but I didn't know really what I said, but I said, did I say something that hurt, that hurt you? And they said, well, we have a confession to make. I said, well, what's your confession? Well, they held up the bottle and they said, this is only half of Grandpa. <laughs> I said, well, where's the other half? And they told me about how the, his wishes were, his dying wishes to be spread at the ocean, at the beach. And as they were doing that, they didn't have the heart to get rid of them all at once. And so they spread half of the ashes there, kept the other half. And now they forever thought they messed up Grandpa because he's half there and half here. <laughs> so what is true? And here's a question I can ask you. Does our body have to be intact to have a new body in the future? Is cremation wrong? What if you lose a, a leg in, in this life, an arm in this life, uh, an ear in this life, an eye in this life? Does that forever impact your resurrected body? Paul is going to give an answer, and his answer has a lot to do with nature, because he's going to tell us, guys, don't you know? Nature has been teaching you about the resurrection all along. Nature shows us how the resurrection of our own bodies will one day take place. And here's some observations that we're going to see as we go through this. The first observation is the original is dissolved. The original is dissolved. Look at verse 36. What you sow does not come to life unless it, what? Dies. Now, whether we know it or not, the resurrection is being taught in the plant world all of this time. And so what happens in, when a seed is planted? The original, the seed, dissolves. It dies. And then a new plant comes forth, looking very different from the little seed that was planted. And so in the same way, our original, our bodies, must die, must dissolve. And let me make a point here. Because Christian tradition for years and years and years, centuries and centuries, has been always to preserve the body. And I think in view of that was because of a resurrected body. But you think of uh, someone who passed away and was put in a, a casket or whatever uh, 500 years ago. What do you think that's left? Just dust, right? Ashes, right? And so that doesn't solve. What if you, you're buried at sea and you're eaten by sharks? I mean, how does that work? Does that mean only those that had a casket or somehow in their sort of Fresh? Is that a word? Can I say that? <laughs> that they're going to have a good resurrected body? And see, I think what Paul is teaching right here already, the seed dies, the seed dissolves. In fact, that old body is not needed. That old body is not necessary anymore. Here's another observation. The original and the final forms are different. The original and the final forms are different. Look at verse 37. When you sow, you do not plant the body that will be. Meaning, our resurrected body is going to be very, very, very different than the body that died. I read on Facebook, I think a few days ago, right after Thanksgiving, someone said, praise the Lord for elastic. <laughs> Referring to the waistline. You know, when you get your resurrected body, you won't have to worry about that anymore. You know, that was worth coming to church for just today, wasn't it? Just to hear that. You're okay. The body that Jesus rose with, arose with, was very different than the body that went to the grave. His glorified body was very different than the earthly body that he had. Uh, remember what Jesus did as you read through the Gospels and the book of Acts? 
He, he, he appeared and disappeared. Remember that? He appeared and disappeared without traveling in any physical way. You go, how'd you do that? And then he would even appear behind locked doors in rooms. How did he do that? He never did any of those things with his earthly body. He had a glorified body. His body was very different. And yet, he could eat. He could be touched. Our brand new body is going to be very different from the one that we have right now. And yet, here's another third observation, yet the two forms have continuity. The two forms have continuity, meaning there's a sameness. There's a likeness. The seed that's planted changes radically, but it still continues in the same life form. So meaning, if you plant wheat, uh, barley doesn't come up. If you plant flax, corn doesn't pop up. I grew up on a farm near northern Minnesota, uh, near the Canadian border, and every time we planted wheat, guess what came up? Wheat. We never planted wheat, and all of a sudden, pigs popped out of the ground, and we had a crop of bacon that year. Uh, that never worked that way. And so what it, uh, Paul is going to tell us and teach us is that whatever is planted stays in the same life form. In fact, Paul, you know, think how long ago he wrote this. And through God's inspiration and leading, he has given us some very good scientific data. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 38 to 39, this is what he says. But God gives it a body as he has determined. And to each kind of seed he gives its own body. All flesh is not the same. Men have one kind of flesh. Animals have another. Birds another. And fish another. You know what that's saying? Just as we did not evolve from animals, we, we don't return and come back as an animal. In fact, there is no repeatable or demonstra demonstrable scientific proof that one life form will change or could change into another life form. And yet many people believe in evolution. And Paul is telling us right here, no, that doesn't happen. There is a man of flesh. And when you plant flesh, what comes back is a glorified human body. Now, on a side note, it's fascinating that when Jesus was raised, you ever think about this? No one recognized him? Nobody recognized him unless he first revealed himself to them. And then once they realized who it was, then they go, oh, now I see. Now, that's mysterious, isn't it? It's, it's hard to figure that out. And yet, remember at times he said, you know, see here my hand, see here my side. He still had the scars. Now, some of you right now, you're thinking, does that mean our scars carry over? I don't think so. I think those were Savior scars. You know, it says in uh, Revelation, a lamb as if slain. I think our Jesus will always have those. It reminds us who he really is. But we're going to get brand new bodies someday. It's a seed that is planted. Our resurrected bodies will have a continuity. They will have a sameness. But I think what this is telling us and what Paul is teaching us here through the illustration of a seed being planted, this is not an identical resurrection. So meaning a baby doesn't come back as a baby. An old person doesn't come back as an old person. There's a sameness. There's a continuity. And so in a sense, it's not what you are right now. It's what you will be, as somebody said. And if God can do this in the plant world, don't you think he can do that to us as well? It's like Paul once asked King Agrippa. He said, is anything too incredible for God? Here's a second reason to be strong. Number two, be strong in light of a splendid body. Be strong in light of a splendid body. You're going to see one word repeated over and over in these next couple of verses. In verses 40 to 41, Paul continues, there are also heavenly bodies and there are also earthly bodies. But the splendor of the heavenly bodies is one kind, and the splendor of the earthly bodies is another. The sun has one kind of splendor, the moon has another, the stars another, and star differs from star in what? Splendor. You know what I think this is pointing out? Our God is a God of splendor. God has this amazing, incredible capacity to create an infinite variety of everything. Uh, there's an infinite variety of planets. There's an infinite variety of stars. There's an infinite variety of just about everything. Have you ever done people watching? Anyone like to do that? You go to a, maybe an airport, you're in a mall, just sitting watching people. Have you ever seen two people look identically the same? It's pretty rare. Even identical twins aren't the same. God has this amazing capacity to create. Now, we're going to do something this morning that we're going to try to show a scale of God's amazing creative ability. His, his depth 
his a, a vast ability to do whatever. And so we're going to have what, what I'm going to call our solar system here on a 15-foot scale. That's pretty hard to do. In fact, uh, this, this beach ball here is going to represent our sun. It's 10,000 degrees. It's really hot right now. It's on the surface here. And this is our sun. So if we use this as a scale, now I can't really do this accurately. And so I'll, you're going to have to try to visualize some of this. We're going to have a camera on this. But here's our sun. I'm going to put our sun here in our solar system. And I'm going to come to our first planet. Now, if I was going to do this for reals to this scale, we'd have to walk a whole block away. But I'm just trying to put it on this scale. And here's our first planet. And you can see it's a little mustard seed. Here's Mercury, uh, the closest planet to the sun. Just a little mustard seed in comparison to the size of the sun. One block away, mind you. Then we come to the next planet. Here's a little BB. This is Venus. And uh, Venus is uh, one of the brightest uh, lights we have in our sky outside of the sun and the moon. We see it in the west uh, every night. And then we come to the planet that I wish I could use this for our planet, this little globe that I have, but that's not the right size. Here's the real size that would have to be. It's just a little P. You see the dark spot there, brown spot on the P? That's, that's the desert. That's where we live. <laughs> <laughs> and then we're going to go another block. So we've gone now four blocks, and we come to Mars. And if you just heard yesterday, Curiosity, the uh, rocket ship just took off. It's going to take nine months to travel from Earth to Mars. And then we're going to have to go about a third of a mile. And Jupiter just rolled off. And there's Jupiter, the orange. It's the largest planet in our solar system. And we're going to go about a quarter of a mile. And we're going to come to Saturn, I believe that is. And that's the golf ball. Now we're going a long distance. We are going quite a ways. We are going about a mile. And we're going to come to Uranus, represented by a marble. Now we go another mile, and we're going to come all the way here to a cherry called Neptune. We're now about four miles out. Now we're going to go a long ways to the very end of our solar system here, and we have Pluto. Now, poor Pluto. <laughs> As you know, it was voted off the island a couple years ago. <laughs> in part because they found something else floating around that's even a little bit larger than Pluto. But since I didn't have a vote, and since I learned as a kid that Pluto is a planet, it's still a planet, okay? It's still there. Now, we are five miles away on this scale, and this is what God has created. And you know, if we went to the next closest star in our solar system, or not or beyond our solar system, next closest star, uh, Alpha Centauri, if we were going to put this on this scale, we'd have to get on a jet, fly 6,000 miles, that's like flying to Japan, and put down another beach ball to show what God has created. Have you ever seen early in the morning how many stars there are? This is the closest one. They are saying now, not just trillions of stars, they are saying six trillions of stars. It's like with 23 zeros after it. Trillions of galaxies. The more they get out in space, the more they can see, they realize the more that there is. Our God has an amazing, incredible capacity to create. And is it too hard for us to think he's going to have a hard time in resurrecting our bodies? And when God does something, he does it with splendor. Have you ever seen a... a you know, we're talking about seeds this morning, like a tulip bulb. They're sort of ugly, right? And then you plant a tulip bulb, what comes up? Drop dead gorgeous. You go, wow. You know, when God is going to resurrect our bodies, it's going to be a different body, and it is going to be looking fine, <laughs> looking splendid. In fact, turn to the person next to you and just say, you will be looking splendid someday. Just, just tell them that. And if you want to earn points, say, hey, you already do, but you're going to be looking even more splendid. <laughs> now we're going to get in trouble here, aren't we? Oh, God does a splendid thing. And if we accept and trust God as the creator God, again, is this going to be too tough for him to recreate and give us a brand new resurrected body? Here's the third thing. Be strong in light of an eternal body. 
Be strong in life and eternal body. Again, now what Paul is doing, he's just starting to weave all these things together, all these truths about what our body is going to be like. In verses 42 to 43, he says, So will it be with the resurrection of the dead. The body that is sown perishable, it is raised what? Imperishable. It is sown in dishonor, is raised in glory, it is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. And our bodies that we have right now, and Pastor Tom talked a lot about this last week, if you were here, it's, they're perishable. From the moment that we're born, our bodies start to decay. But because of his power, because of his glory, when we get our resurrected bodies, time is no longer an issue. A hundred years, a thousand years, a million years has no bearing on a resurrected body. A resurrected body by God stays resurrected. It's an eternal body. I love what Peter wrote. Uh, Peter wrote this in 1 Peter 3 through 4. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is something we should get excited about. This is something we should praise God for. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Because Jesus was resurrected, so will we. And into an inheritance that can never, what's it say? Perish. And he just he wants to emphasize it and make it really clear. Spoil or fade. Kept in heaven for you and me. Isn't that great? This is an eternal body. Here's another one. Another reason to be strong. Be strong in light of a spiritual body. Be strong in light of a spiritual body. In verses 44 to 46. It is so in a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. He's referring to our physical body. If there is a natural body, there are also is also a spiritual body. So it is written, the first man, Adam, came, became a living being. The last Adam, a life-giving spirit. The spiritual did not come first, but the natural. And after that, the spiritual. Now, Paul continues by saying, we have a natural body, but if you're going to get a resurrected body, it needs to become a spiritual body. Because our body needs to change if we're going to live in the afterlife. Because right now, our bodies are really limited. Just, in fact, just look down. Just look at your body for a second. Just look at your body. See that? Okay. This body's not going to cut it. <laughs> this body's not going to make it. This natural body needs to change into a spiritual body. Because right now, the reason why, this, this natural body is so limited. It can only live in one realm. It can only live and survive in the physical world. You know, we can't live on the sun, can we? We can't live in Mercury or Venus. You know, it's interesting. We can live on Earth... In fact, here's Earth, 93 million miles away, and if it was a million closer, a million farther away, we'd be toast. We would be in trouble. And yet, even on Earth, we can barely live. You know, we can't, we can't live up in the highest mountains. We can't live underwater, can we? Our physical body can only live in a certain realm. You know, we're having a hard time living in the high desert, aren't we? And so, our physical body is very limited, and God says, I need to give you a spiritual body. A spiritual body that can live in the spiritual realm. Now, does that mean we're going to have bodies that are ghost-like and floating around? No. Look what it says. It's a body. The noun is a body. What kind of body? The adjective? It's a spiritual body that can live in the spiritual realm. Here's what Jesus described it as. Look at Luke 20, verses 35 and 36. But those who are considered worthy of taking part in the in that age and in the resurrection from the dead will neither marry nor be given in marriage. Now, don't, don't get hung up on that. Some of you are real sad about that. Some of you might be glad. I don't know. But that's not the point. Verse 36, but they can no longer what? Die. Eternal body. And then it says, for they are what? Like the angels. Does it say they are angels? No, it says they are like the angels. And a lot of people at uh, funerals will say, oh, now they're an angel in heaven. And they're not doing that uh, they're doing that because they've been told that. <laughs> and they've been told that so many times they start to believe it. You know, we'll be like angels, meaning we will have spiritual bodies that can live in the spiritual realm. That's what Paul is teaching here. And so we will be like the angels. We will be perfectly equipped for our life to come with a spiritual body. And Paul goes on. Now, number five, he says, Be strong in light of a heavenly body. Not only is it eternal, but it is heavenly. Verses 47 to 48. The first man was from the dust of the earth. That's referring to Adam. The second man from heaven, referring to Christ. 
As was the earthly man, so are those who are of the earth. And as is the man from heaven. I love that phrase, you know, Jesus, our Jesus is the man from heaven. And so also are those who are of heaven. And one day we will have a heavenly body. Just as Adam was a prototype for the physical race of mankind, what Paul is teaching here is that Jesus was the prototype. The man from heaven was the prototype for the spiritual race of mankind. And it's through Jesus that we will have a heavenly body someday. Won't that be great? Ladies especially, you can probably finally say, I look heavenly, because you really do. Okay, number six, another reason. We're seeing eternal, heavenly, be strong in light of a Christ-like body. You see how Paul, again, is just weaving, orchestrating all these beliefs right through this manuscript. Be strong in light of a Christ-like body, verses 49 to 50. And just as we have been born in the likeness of an earthly man, remember that's Adam, so shall we bear the, what's it say? Likeness of the man from heaven, of Jesus. And I declare to you, brothers, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the perishable. This flesh and blood body cannot make that transition. It's not going to heaven. I need a brand new body. And I need a body just like Christ. Not that I am Christ. He's our only Savior. But I need a glorious body just like him. John the Apostle wrote about this in 1 John 3, 2. He says, Dear friends, now we are children of God. And look what he says. And what we will be has not yet been made known. You know, we can't go into the future. We don't have people coming back from the other side showing us, hey, here's what my body is like. You know, ask me a bunch of questions. Uh, we just know that Jesus had that glorified body. That's what we understand. And he said we will have that. But then John says, but we know that when he appears, we shall be what? Just like him. Just like him. For we shall see him as he is. Number seven, be strong in light of a quick change body. You know, you've heard of a quick change artist. They change from one piece of clothing to another piece of clothing really quick. This is a quick change body. Changes very quickly. Verses 51 to 53, listen, I tell you a mystery. Here's a mystery. He said, we will not all sleep, not all die. Some people will be alive when Christ returns. And they will get a new body then. But he says, but we will all, referring to all who believe in Jesus, will be changed in a flash, in a moment. Uh, the word there is the Greek word atomus. It means it comes from the word atom, the smallest particle you can think of. And in a, a smallest amount of time, this is going to take place. In the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised and perishable, and we will be changed. When this change happens, this is not a step-by-step -step process. You don't have to do step one and then wait 10 days and then do step two and then at the right time do step three. This is not a, a metamorphosis of some kind. This is just like that. Twinkling of an eye. You go, ooh, I feel good. <laughs> just in a moment, our bodies will change. Last one. Paul's going to tell us, be strong in light of a victorious body. Be strong in light of a victorious body. Verse 54. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then the saying as written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. And again, last week, Pastor Tom talked about the death of death. Do you remember that? Death lost its power. Death lost. Verses 55 to 57, Paul wraps it up this way. Where, O death, is your victory? You don't have it. Where, O death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin. The power of sin is in the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Death is defeated. And guess what, guys? We win because Christ wins. Isn't that great? And we have and will have a resurrected body. And death is no longer what it was. Death is now a portal. Death is now just that doorway into our afterlife and to receive our resurrected body. Let me wrap this sort of up this way. Let me, let me give you a take home. I'm going to give you a one do or one don't and two do's. How's that? Here's the first one. Here's the don't. Don't be afraid if you know Jesus. Don't be afraid if you know Jesus. Death is scary, isn't it? I'm scared of it. But Jesus says, I'll be there. I'll take your hand. And he reaches out his hand, his nail-pierced hand, and he grabs ours. And he says, I will lead you. You're my friend. I lose not one. I'm the great shepherd. 
I will be with you. And I hope it's when it's my turn to die that I have some friends and family reminding me of those things. I have told uh, some of you before about our son. Our son had three major heart surgeries before the age of five. And right before his last heart surgery, so he's just five years old, or just about five, he asked his mom and me a couple of questions. Uh, the first question he asked, he said, rather than putting a zipper in my chest, that's how we described to him what was going to take place, he said, can't they get to my heart by going through my ear? <laughs> now, that's a probing of a little mind just trying to take the easy way out, right? And then he asked another question. He said, Mom, Dad, how are they going to get into my heart if Jesus is already there? And he realizes that simple childlike faith and I, I would encourage you with that when it comes to our own demise or even those of a loved one it's that simple childlike faith that's going to get us through that time it's knowing the truth and being strong in that truth as it's been said God's people die differently there's a hope here's a second thing this morning to do, do reach out to a lost world. Reach out to a lost world. Our time on earth is valuable, uh, meaning we have a lot of work to do for God's kingdom. And we need to invite people to take part in the great exchange program. And here's what I mean by that. Jesus says, give me your life and I will give you mine. It's a great exchange. You know what it's, it's like exchanging a nickel for $500 million. And even that doesn't compare it's a great exchange program, and we need to be about our Father's business. Our labor will not be in vain when others join us in God's kingdom forever and ever with their brand new resurrected body. Here's a third thing and last thing. Do give your life to Jesus. Do give your life to Jesus if you have not yet done so. Jesus said, if you're going to have a brand new eternal spiritual Christ-like, resurrected, glorified body, you need to be born again. We all have a natural body right now. It's a natural birth. But he said, if you are going to have this promise that we've been talking about this morning, you need to be born again. You need to have a spiritual birth to prepare you for a spiritual life to come. How can you do that? At HTC, we say it's the ABCs. You have to admit that you're far away from God that you have sinned. B, that you believe that Jesus is that only Savior. He is the only one that died on the cross for our sins. And C, you need to choose. You need to choose to exchange your life. Give your life to him and he will give his life to you. If you have not done yet, I would hope you would take advantage of even this morning and this time right now as we're going to bow in prayer to make sure you too have that promise. So just in quietness right now, would you bow your heads in prayer? Let's go to him. Father, I want to thank you for the mercy and grace you've had on me because I sure didn't deserve it. I thank you for the grace and mercy you've had on uh, so many others here today because they didn't deserve it either. Lord, we praise you and we thank you for your creative amazing power that can resurrect our bodies for all eternity. Lord, thank you. Thank you for the hope that that gives us. Thank you how it takes away so much of the fear. Lord, I pray right now for someone who is here and they have never made that great exchange. They have never given their life over to you. And not just some of their life, but all of their life. Lord, I pray that in their heart of hearts right now, they would just cry out to you. Give their life to you. And Lord, thank you for your promise that when we invite you into our lives, into our hearts, into our souls, you come in and you stay in. You will never leave us or forsake us. Lord, we thank you that you hear just very simple, childlike prayers. In the name of Jesus, our Savior, we pray. Amen.